Um, all right, here we go. So uh, looks like top rank question goes to uh, Stephen Darrow. Um, yeah. Uh, Steve Darrow asks, uh, most of us revere Thomas Sowell as the greatest public intellectual and philosopher of the last 40 years. He took that mantle from Milton Friedman, who carried the torch for 30 years. Dr. Soul turned 87 this year. Who do you think is in line to become the, that great public intellectual for the next 40 years? That's an excellent question. Um, I do know for a certain fact it's not going to be yours truly because both of those guys have 40 IQ points on me. Um, and and they, they think full time and I mostly just, you know, talk. Uh, with that said, I think there's an interesting uh, answer to this. And, and the answer, Steve, is that it doesn't have to be anybody. And that's the beauty of this philosophy. That's why I like it so much. It doesn't require you to be a theorist. I've seen what happens when you put intellectuals and theorists in charge of things. I've seen what happens when, uh, when the, the um, Zenobiites, you know, are arguing with the Trotskyists and, and, um, and all the rest of it. And it's, and it's a bloody, horrible nightmare. So the entire reason I like conservatism so much as a philosophy is it, it's simple, it's tried and true, and it works. So yes, as uh, Eric Blake says, the smartest man in America may be forced to retire just because of biology finally catching up to that brain of his. But it's not rocket science. Or I suppose I should say it's not brain surgery. In any event, it's not rocket surgery. Uh, Eric suggested Ben Shapiro. Ben Shapiro might be a very good uh, might be a very good choice for that. I, I find that Ben Shapiro is more effective on political issues than I think on um, on the philosophical issues. Which is not to say for a moment that he doesn't understand them. But but the the guy's a bulldog, and um, and there he goes. Dave Big Booty says love of theory is the root of all evil. Amen to that, brother. Never heard that before, but that's absolutely true. But this is the entire point, right? There's nothing about this philosophy that requires a PhD or a big intellect. Now, I know the left will say, ha, 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 see how stupid they are, but there's an expression I'm trying to coin desperately, uh, and that is, you know, um, any idiot can make things complicated. It takes a genius to make something simple. And that's the beauty of, of what we call conservatism. It's just simple. You can't spend more money than you make over time. You can borrow some, but you can't just continue to print money to pay off a debt because the, the currency will collapse. Uh, there are good people and bad people in the world. I'm perfectly willing to admit that many, if not most, of the bad people, if not all of the bad people, turned into bad people because they were raised by other bad people. But that doesn't, that doesn't um, negate the fact that there are bad people out there who are who are predators. They're human predators, and they need to be treated as such. It'd be nice if it wasn't true, but it is true. Um, and uh, by the way, uh, it's strange. Uh, the um, there I was looking a little bit into. I did quite a bit of reading two weeks ago on on early man and his expansion out of Africa and so on. And it looks like there were two waves of, of migration. And the first wave went uh, hundreds of thousands of years before the second, and they developed into uh, the Neanderthals. But the second wave came much later, and, and apparently numbers, numerous times, um, humans had tried to get out of Africa and had been stopped, apparently by the Neanderthals or, or uh, Java man in the east. So finally, uh, using the latest in the genetic um, uh, toolbox, they think that, the, that a band left Africa and that there may have been anywhere from 150 to about 450 people in that band, from which all of the non-African uh, tree of descent comes from. And that must have been a hell of an adventure. Uh, so since that time, which has been quite a while ago, um, we have had a, a, a fair amount of trial and error experience. And these uh, millennia of trial and error have taught us certain things, and some of those things are the things I mentioned. Sometimes there are bad people out there and they want to hurt you. And um, some people like hurting you. And those people have to be stopped, and they can't be stopped by uh, kind words. It'd be nice if it were true, but it's not so it isn't. 
they have to be stopped with violent force. And uh, that has to be administered by people who are capable of administering violent force without being violent and cruel themselves. It's a, it's a tough trick. That requires um, parenting and discipline and, and guidance and all the rest of it. Um, that's basically how things work. Uh, it also is um, true that, that for all of human history, the, you, you, you'd think it was the smartest people were in charge. It's certainly not true. They're, it's certainly the people that, that became great emperors, the, the beginning of dynasties, guys like you know Genghis Khan and Caesar, Alexander, and all the rest. They were breakout geniuses, but the quality to maintain rule over humans throughout history has been cruelty and ruthlessness. The willingness to do things that other people are not willing to do. They, the, the people who have basically been the administrators and the mainstays of all of the dictatorships and everything that, that, that has taken place in social organization since we stopped being hunter-gatherers. By the way, hunter-gatherer uh, societies are very egalitarian. They have to be because nobody owns anything, and the reason they don't own anything is because they're moving all the time. They literally own what they carry, and that's about it. So it is a very egalitarian society, uh, and everybody's more or less equal in a hunter-gatherer society, but the problem is everybody is stone dirt poor. Uh, and I don't mean just not having Cadillacs either. I mean, they're fighting all the time, and they're, and they're one day away from starvation. So. so it's not like any of this stuff is new, and it's not like it's a theory that Thomas Sowell had, and it's not like uh, Milton Friedman came up with this weird mathematical formula that... Uh, that um, that has to be, you know, uh, translated and expounded upon in the way that Marx did, for example. It's pretty simple stuff, really. Um, and primary among the things that people do not understand that gets clearer to me every day is not just how capitalism and freedom and republics work, but why they work. And the why, I think, is that it requires... The whole act of civilization required people to become less aggressive. There's pretty good, um, pretty good compelling evidence that, uh, that one of the mutations that had to happen, in, because there were hunter-gatherer societies for millennia, 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 tens of thousands of years, suddenly people settled down in one spot, and uh, people are, are, um, are speculating that, that it was a mutation that basically made uh, humans considerably less fierce, less fierce. Uh, you have to be less fierce to be in a in a civilization where you're up against other people and other people tell you what to do. That that fundamental, um, you know, original uh, original group out of Africa's uh, fierceness, which was re required to survive, um, had to eventually go away because you can't have cities when everybody's, you know, not going to take orders from anybody else. Some people maintain a sense of ruthlessness, and because they're ruthless, they're willing to do things, as I say, that other people find repulsive or, or just too risky for them, and those people are the ones who um, have dominated society until the United States of America came along. And what I've learned about the United States of America, I spent the first half of my career, or two-thirds of my career, understanding how it works, and the last third or so, understanding why it works. And the more I think about it, the more I come back to things that Friedman talked about, and and Thomas Sowell has talked about, and Prager has talked about, and all the rest. Um, and, and I was wrong about this when I started. Uh, you, you have to have the right raw material, and the raw material consists of virtue. Hard work it, well, that is a virtue, but virtue. You, 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 have to, you have to start from a place of fundamental decency. And that fundamental decency historically has been baked into the culture through religion. And the thing about Christianity is with an internal conscience rather than an external judge, the idea that your conscience lives inside you, that means that you, you have to become virtuous to the best of your ability simply because it's what's required of your philosophy. It's not like, well, if nobody's watching, I can get away with it. It's not like that. And if you're not a virtuous people, if you're not a virtuous population, then you can't have a republic because the entire idea of a republic is leaving people alone. And when you leave people alone, they can do amazing things. When you allow them to cooperate voluntarily but don't force them to cooperate, they'll go to the moon, by golly. Um, but you can't have violent, uh, fierce people 
living together without virtue. And not only is virtue not being taught today, but virtue, or, 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 or instilled is a better word, I guess, but it's actively being mocked and derided, and, and the opposite of virtue is, uh, is being promoted at a very high rate. And the consequences of this to the fabric of the society will not be pleasant. I'm sure Thomas Sowell can see that, and so can so could Friedman, and, and so can anybody. And that's what I like about this philosophy. Anybody can pretty much pick it up. Okay, as usual.